Well, there was, no, there was no need in doing a scripture reading since I was going to be speaking this morning. We will just read this scripture together. So who knows what the theme for this weekend is? It states simply, when it's time to go, it's time to go. When it's time to go, it is time to go. Let us turn into our Bibles to Luke, Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, and we're a very familiar text, but we're going to start at verse 20. Luke 21, starting at verse 20. And when you have it, let me hear you say amen. amen. God's word says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. Does that sound like something we bet that they had better do or something that they could do? They better do. Verse 22 says, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be, what? Great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, in your Bible, are these words in blue or red? red? They're in red. So what does that denote? Jesus said it. So now I want you to get the, get the picture. This is Jesus speaking. He is telling his people what's about to happen. What's going to happen? That Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Now, you would think that if the people don't listen to Jeremiah or Isaiah or any other prophet, you think that they would listen to Jesus himself. He told them, listen, I'm, this is not an object lesson. This is not something that, you know, I'm just trying to get you to learn something. I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. Jerusalem, the city you're in, is going to be destroyed. That's a prophecy. That's a sure word of prophecy. Now, my question is, why did, why didn't God's people heed the counsel from the creator himself? He told them Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And let me, let me tell you how urgent and bad it is. When it happens. If you're in the field, don't come home. If you're in the city, when you see the sign that denotes that Jerusalem is about to be overthrown, get out at that moment. Do not wait. Don't go home to pack nothing. Don't go try to get your clothes. Don't try to get that last thing. Don't try to get that last meal at your nice table. Leave immediately. He made sure they knew, listen, this is not a plaything. I'm telling you what's going to happen. And when you see it happens, when you see it happen, make your move. Now, has Christ spoke to us the same way? 
Now, if he has spoken to us the same way, when you heard this, when we read this, I could see the look on many faces. You're like, man, they should have got out of Jerusalem. They should have wasted no time. And the thing about it is when you study what happened here, one army came, Cestus came, and besieged Jerusalem. Right? They were, man, what are we going to do? They were starving. They were eating their children. They were chewing the leather of their belts. They were doing all these things. They were suffering. Now, they were suffering because they had rejected Christ when he was here on earth. Because of that, that, that rejection, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. So now they're surrounded. Do you think that somebody thought then, oh, you know what? We were told that our city was going to be destroyed. Do you think that it resonated then? Oh, yeah. Jesus said that 30 years ago. 40 years ago. Oh, man, yeah, that's true. Ooh, what are we going to do? And soon as the army pulled back, and this is God's providence, because the army pulled back because something was going on back at home that they had to go help the king put down an insurrection. But instead of leaving, they thought, you know what? Let's beat them. So while the army was leaving and retreating, they went after them with force they didn't understand and almost destroyed the army as they were trying to retreat. But what did, what did Jesus tell them? Listen, when you see that, when you see this sign, that is your moment. Get out. If you're already outside working, and tilling, and you turn around, and you see the sign, don't even come back. Leave right then. Now, the army pulled back. The Jews went after them and almost destroyed them. And what are they thinking? Look what God did for us. Then, they took their food. They almost wiped out the army and they come back joyous. But what was the prophecy? Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Yeah. Now, how is it, y'all? This is something to think about because I, I, I've become very big on object lessons. How is it that God will speak to us and tell us something and be very direct with it? And then something else happens. It seems like a blessing. And we forget what God said. And now we're like, look what God did for me. Right. Now, brothers and sisters, when God tells us to do something, we have to follow through it. God does not change his mind. If God speaks it, that's it. It's not going to change. If it was going to change, he'd have said it at the beginning. Uh, this is going to happen. Then this will happen. If God says, get out. If God says, get the victory. If God says, get to know me. If God says the time of trouble that's coming will be greater than anything you've ever seen. If he says the only way you're going to make it is if you know me personally, then what should we be doing? Getting to know him personally, because that's going to help us get the victory. That's going to help us be where we need to be. But why is it that when something good happens, like we get more money? Or a door open for something else, some temporal prosperity, and suddenly we're like, look what God did for me. Then now I think it's my turn to shine a little bit. And so we get caught up instead of being obedient to what the prophets have told us. They didn't leave. They came back to the city. Ah. Then the other army showed up. This time, there was no leaving. But because the first time when the army left, they thought, well, when the, we'll just wait it out until this army leaves. When they leave, we'll do the same thing to them that we did the last time. But the prophecy says your city going to be destroyed completely until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. 
Well, y'all, this time it was so bad that as they were trying to, they, they got tired of gnawing on the leather. They were eating each other and kids and the, the, the younger people were taking advantage of the older people. Then they were trying to sneak out of the city at night to go find some, some, some food out on the ground to eat or get some of the, the fruit growing in the orchards. And as they were doing this, the army would catch them and kill them. Now, when you look at the history of what happened, it says that for a few furlongs outside the city, you just saw crosses of people hanging. I bet people were wondering, man, is this it? But if they were thinking that this is it, it was already too late to get out. Now, brothers and sisters, we're trying, we're trying to set the stage because what's about to transpire is about to transpire, but that's when many of us are going to wake up and go, is this it? Uh, I, I've been watching I've been seeing what's happening on the news. I've been seeing what's happening in the church. I've been listening to all these voices. And I, I, I didn't make a move because I'm listening to everybody. Instead of listening to what God has told us. Now, brothers and sisters, I just want I'm going to put this caveat out here and I'm going to move on. There are a bunch of ministers and ministries with loud voices. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you who to listen to. That ain't my place. But what I'm telling you is that right now, every wind of doctrine is blowing within the ranks of what would be called present truth. And God's people are standing confused, not sure which way to go. Because one favorite minister is saying this. The other one is saying this. And I, I'm, I like both of them, and I don't know which one to trust or believe. So I'm sitting still in Jerusalem. Now, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's some people I, I like to listen to. There are. But I vet them every single time. It's what they're saying in the scripture. Is it taken out of context? Because guess what? Peter thought he was safe. Lord, I will never leave your side. I will take the life of anybody who comes close. And the very next second, Satan had done took control of him. He wasn't safe. Not even standing right next to Christ was he safe. He needed to be connected, and he was not connected. Jesus had to rebuke him. In the end, Peter kept saying, Lord, is it me? Lord said, Peter, when you are converted, then you can strengthen the brethren. Until then, you need to get to know me. Now, we saw that we can see the difference in Peter's life after he got on one accord with Jesus. He got busy and he was able to strengthen the brethren. But before then, he was all this. I always say he tried to he tried to commit murder in Jesus name. But I want you to think of something now. He was ready to commit murder in Jesus name because that was what was in his. Well, in the midst of a crisis. Who we are will come out. Mercy, mercy. If we don't know Jesus for ourselves, we can sit here right now and look nice and smug. Right. 
and look like we have it together and look like we know what we're talking about and look like we really believe. But when someone comes to you and it could cost you your life to stand for Jesus Christ, who you are for real, that's what's going to come out. So if you really don't know him, you're going to be fearful of standing. You will leave the premises. You will turn on your brother and sister. Now, brothers and sisters, when I tell you, and I know you hear this everywhere, but we are about to step into a situation that there has not been words to adequately describe. And the only way we're going to make it is through our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I tell people everywhere I go, let me tell you what the present truth is. The present truth is, am I right with the Lord? Do I know him? That is the present truth. Everything else are present truth, I mean, are present day facts. What's going on in the church? It's happening. We can't get around it. Apostasy is everywhere. But God told us that was going to happen. So it's not a shock. When I see it, well, that's what God said was going to happen. So at least we're we on the right track. I don't get fearful. Neither do I get upset. Neither do I get bent out of shape. Neither do I jump on every platform and start. We need to be reminded that we're living in the time of the shaking. This is supposed to happen. When you read Ezekiel, what is the last condition of God's church? What, is, what are they seen doing? They, they eventually turned their back on the temple. They faced the east and worshiped the sun. That's where we're going. So why are you upset? Because consciences have been pressed. Y'all, we, it's going all the way there. Do we believe that? Will we give up on God's church when we see it happen? Will we be alarmed? We should not be. Because God's word says this was going to happen. And only until then, only when that happens, did the, God's presence rise up and leave. Now, I don't care what no ministers say. I don't care who he is. I don't care who they are. God is not going to leave his church until that happens. That's what his word says. So I stand firmly right there. I don't get nervous. I don't get worked up. I see it. I identify it. Sign of the times. Sign of the times. Sign of the times. Sign of the times. That lets me know I'm on the right ship. And why would I jump off this ship right now? Why would I jump off this ship right now? When the ship is going the right way. It ain't the way God wants, but he's going the way he said it would. So I, this is it. Now. The army came in. Let me just tell you how sure God's word is. The army, when they came in, they looked at the temple and thought, this place is beautiful. We're not going to burn this down. The, the, the head of the army said, no, 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 don't burn it down. Leave it. It's too pretty. But what did God say? It's going to destroy this whole city. When they got in, Start milling around. Somebody said, you know what? I'm going to set this place on fire. And dropped a firebrand. And whoosh, the temple went up. And just what God said would happen, that's exactly what happened. They destroyed the whole city. They killed everybody there. The ones who got away, they, they took them captive. They were running to and fro. There was nothing left in Jerusalem. Now, brothers and sisters, 
God has told us, I've given you a certain amount of time to get your life in order. I'm not going to give you a timetable because that will cause you to be unfaithful. So there's no more time prophecies. I'm just going to give you some events to watch for along the way. Now, we're going to talk about it this morning. We're going to get into the seven churches in just a little bit. But I'm going to tell you right now, we are about to experience the spirit of Jezebel in this country. Persecution is around the corner. I can tell you right now, you know, if you watch the debates and you saw what happened, you saw one side keep tripping up the other side all night long. Just, just, he kept falling for it. And I know what you thought, man, look, she's doing good. She's going to be the president. I hope you weren't happy. I hope you weren't happy. But I tell you, if Trump gets it, it, it ain't no better. Just flip the coin over. That's all that is. Anyone could do what God said to us is going to happen. But we're about to see the spirit of Jezebel take place. Are you ready for that? Right now, the world is in turmoil more than we know. You know we don't see all the news. You do know that. Certain things aren't, aren't broadcast in America. They hear about it somewhere else. But we hear about all their stuff over here. But I'm telling you, this country is in trouble. The educators and statesmen are all trying to figure out, how can I fix it? What did God tell us? It's unfixable. So if you're hoping that your investments are going to take a different turn, what else did the prophet tell us? Put that money to work for God. If you're hoping that your 401k and all this other stuff will do much better, I understand where you're coming from, but God said the money is going to fail. That's what he said. So at what point will we get serious and be like, listen, let me stop looking at this and let me go this way. Some of us have waited too long. I'm going to move on when I say this because this is going to shock you. Some of us have not thought about the fact that some of us because we haven't gotten out of the city, for whatever reason, we're not going to make it out. Now, that's a hard saying. Some people aren't going to make it out. But the prophet doesn't say that you will be lost. It said it will be 10 times harder. So my question is, no matter where you are, And we should be trying to get out of the city with all we have, because if not, that means that we are being an unfaithful servant. But brothers and sisters, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, are we getting to know Jesus for ourselves? That's the question. Am I doing all that I can right now to help prepare for what is coming? I I said this to a dear sister a couple weeks ago. And she stood still in her tracks, frozen. She said, what? Some, some people are not going to get out? I said, yeah, some people are not going to get out. What are we doing to get close to Christ? What would happen if we got a, some of us would get out in the country and just bring the city right on with us? Well, so I, 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 I'm going to leave you where you are because... I'll, have, I'll get more of your attention where you are. But brothers and sisters, wherever we are, because some of us are in the country, and we're still not getting to know Christ. We're still not. The trials are still not having the effect that they're supposed to have. I was just reading, uh, and I wanted to put it in here, but it would have took me somewhere else. But we're told that if we don't pass the trial or the test, we will have to, I heard somebody say we're going to come back again and again 
and again until we pass. We will not be able to skip test and trial and get get to another level. It's not going to happen. We got to pass the test as God is giving them to us now. Now, when we drop down from reading about Jerusalem and we drop down to verse 32. This is Luke 21 still. We're at verse 32. He's already talked about the fig tree. And right at the end of that, it says, Verily I say unto you. What's those next words? This generation shall not, what? Shall not pass away to what? Now, 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 this generation shall not pass. But just in case you're still asking, How do we know that this generation is that generation? Let's go back up to verse 25. And it says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Have these events already taken place? Yes, they have. All right, now let's look at this. And upon the earth, distress of nations. Is that past or present or future? That's present. That's our day. So right in the middle of the verse, we find a timetable. It, this brings us to today. The other events, the sun, moon, and stars, have all, that stuff has already taken place. Now we're in the verse that's talking about today. So this is us that we're reading about. And upon the earth, distress of nations. Now, distress of nations have been happening. Distress just means they're not getting along. They're fighting. Wars. Rumors of wars. Right? So the distress of nations, but it gives us some extra. With perplexity. It's saying that there's distress of nations to the point of not having a solution. Now, there's never been a time where you could look and say they don't have a solution. But now, it's clear the distress of nations are elevating and there's no solution for it. So then that helps us understand this is different than just wars and rumors of wars. It's the stress of nations with perplexity. And then it says, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, ah, come on. We'll come back to that later. Here we go. The sea and the waves roaring. So now we have the stress of nations with no way out on this level. That ship looks like it may not make it. And anybody on that ship is probably begging for mercy and praying, please let this storm settle down. But here's what I want you to look at. This is not the four winds of strife unleashed. This ain't the four winds. So Revelation 7, that's not what this is talking about. This is just the distress of nations with perplexity on that level. Everything is out of control. Our moral compass, I think, is gone. I don't think we have one. The money is funny. It's been that way for a long time. Our temporal prosperity is going down. You want to wake people up and get them angry, mess with their money. This is all producing a chaotic environment that's going to bring on a Sunday law. And we're just reviewing right now. This this stuff, we should, we've at least talked about it or heard it somewhere. But we're talking about distress of nations with perplexity, but on this level. Not only is this situation perplexing, 
It is dangerous. Death could result from this storm. So the distress of nations with perplexity on this level. Does that, does that make that a little more understandable? With the sea and the ra- waves roaring. Then the Bible tells us in the next verse, men's hearts failing them for fear. Why? For looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Do you think that if you were on this ship, your heart might fail you for fear? This is why their, 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 your, their hearts are failing them for fear. Because when they look at the world, this is what they see. Now, they come on TV, nice suit and stuff in their hand, and they walk up to the podium with some confidence and start talking to the camera and talk. And you get confident because you believe them. But God said, distress of nations with perplexity, with the sea and the waves roaring. Do we believe that we're living in that time? If we believe that we're living in this time, what should we be doing? All right, now, 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 I hear that all the time. What does that look like, getting ready? Clinging to Jesus, I like that one. Searching your hearts. When, when we look at the shaking in early writings, she says that she saw some with strong faith, and agonizing cries. But what was the agonizing cries about, y'all? What was the, pa- their faces were pale, expressive of what? The internal struggle. The in- internal struggle. So they look, they're looking at the prophecies, and they're seeing what's going on, they're seeing what level is on, and then they're looking in the word of God, and they're going, man, is that Christ's character? And they're holding up a mirror, and they go, but that ain't me. That's not me. And they're falling back on their knees and they're begging and pleading with God, remake me. This is the present truth. We got to get to know Jesus for ourselves. Right now. Right now. If we wait for some other better time, a way for the Spirit of God to do something in us, for us, that will make me desire to be like him. We were going to wait too long, and we are going to be lost. Now, all through God's word are parallels showing us what is unfolding in front of us. What we have to do, brothers and sisters, is study the word of God. Now, now, I'll just share this with you. My father could stand up here and preach and preach for two, three hours, no problem whatsoever. He could just, y'all know. I would be sitting right back there doing the buttons and talking on the camera. And I would hear stuff that I could regurgitate, but I wasn't learning it. I wasn't going home and opening the word of God and studying it for myself. So I wasn't getting to know it for myself. Then dad passes away. Suddenly, I realize I don't know it. And God is saying, but I'm calling you. Go preach. Uh-uh, Lord. Uh-uh. I don't have it. I don't know. It wasn't until that crisis for me that I realized I don't know it. I can't tell them. I can't tell them where it's found. And you want me to get up in front of people and preach? I don't know it. And now I can't go back and ask my father for some explanation. God says, I want you to go home, and I want you to open the Bible for yourself. And I want you to start reading and ask me for understanding. Are we doing this? Are we asking God, show me this for myself?
help me to understand it so it's in here. So that if I'm not around anybody and a test comes to me, I can stand. Or are we leaning on our spouse? Are we leaning on our friend? Or are we getting to know it for ourselves? I can't save you and you can't save me. Dr. O can't save you, you can't save him. You think of the minister, you, they can't save you and you can't save them. We all are going to have to stand for ourselves. It's got to be in here. And the shaking is designed to cause us to pick one side or the other. I want you to get that. The shaking is designed to make me choose the side of Satan or follow Christ. Is it having its intended effect? Do you know what side you're on? Do you know who you serve? The prophet tells us that we do not have to choose the side of Satan to follow him. All we have to do is not choose to follow Christ. And by default, we are following Satan himself. He said, those whom I can get to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures, I have them. I know I got them. I don't worry about them. I'm only worried about those who are getting to know Christ. Is our lifestyle making Satan nervous? Or is he sitting around going, I'm not worried about them. We're living in a time where Satan should be nervous of our actions day after day. I'm going to tell you right now, if we get about God's business, Satan will unleash something on you. Because he doesn't want to lose one soul. So, I'll tell you this before we go on. If Satan is not dogging your trail, something is wrong. When we are taking subjects from Satan... He will fight. But if our life in waiting for Christ to come right now is one of ease, we're in the wrong place. Think about that. God's word says, let's look at a parallel before we, I still got a little time, but I say that and then it's going to be gone. Let's go to Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 1. Let's start at verse 9. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. Revelation 1 verse 9 says, I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos. Why was he there? And what? All right, so did you, did you grab what you just read? He was on the isle of Patmos. Was he there vacationing? No. Why was he there? He was in prison. But hold on, but hold on, hold on. Who put him there? God placed him there. But who on earth put him there? Caesar, Rome. But why did they do that? Hold on, y'all missing it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Who was angry with John? Satan. Who did Satan use? He used his people, the Jews. Rome was unconcerned with John. It was the Jews who were angry. They said, our agenda cannot advance as long as John is around. And we've already tried to kill him, but he's unkillable. 
He's unkillable because God says it's not his time. So he's not going to die. So they put him on the Isle of Patmos. So when he's writing, he's getting ready to talk to you about the seven churches. He says, I'm on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So he was being in prison because he stood for thus said the word of God and it was his own people that put him there. Now chew on that for a second. He was on the Isle of Patmos. He says, I'm your companion in what? In tribulation. I'm in tribulation right now. I'm on, an isle, I'm on an island that is not comfortable. It ain't fun to be here, but God's got me here for a reason. So I'm writing to you to let you know we are brothers. I'm your companion in tribulation. And here's why I'm here. So what is that telling you and I? If we stand for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, what is going to happen to us? We are going to be persecuted. We're going to be exiled. We're going to be killed. We're going to be unliked by everybody. Now, while you're chewing on that, it goes on to say, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heart and, and heard, sorry, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto who? Laodicea. Who, who, who's Laodicea? We, we are. Now, brothers and sisters, we finna find out something about us. Have you ever thought about what makes us lukewarm. There's a reason why we lukewarm. And God's word tells us exactly why. Now we may know why, but we need to know that God's word spells it out to show us this is why you are lukewarm. And this is why I would rather spew you out because you're neither hot nor cold. Now let's keep reading. I turn to the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the floor, down to the foot, I'm sorry, I should have my glasses up here, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now let's drop down to verse 20. It says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now let's make a quick connection here. Where else in the Bible do you find a prophecy or messages where the message is attached to an angel giving the message. I mean, you better spit that right on out. Revelation 14. Now, the angels represented in Revelation 14, John was seen in a vision. But those angels represent who? All of us. When you, the messages are given, they're supposed to be given by us. All right. So now, what did he just say? In his right hand, he had stars. The stars are who? The, the, the angels of the churches. The candlesticks represent 
the churches. So now we have angels and churches. There's a message that John is giving to the churches. Now, if the angels represent us in Revelation 14, who do the angels represent in Revelation chapter 1 here? This message has got to be given by somebody. Somebody's got to speak these messages to the churches. Now, they're in red because Christ spoke these to him. But we have got a message that we have got to give to Laodicea. God is counting on you and I to give the message that Laodicea needs to hear. But when we look at the seven churches, we start to see something. Every part of the seven churches are found in Laodicea. Every one. So as you read the message to Ephesus, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and Pergamos, and we, we're going to go through them. Those messages were to tell them what was happening and what was going to happen and to tell us what is coming to us. That makes sense? All right. Chapter 2. Starting with verse 1 says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Oh, one other thing before I go forward. He told John, listen, I want you to write these things so that the people will know what is happening and what is going to happen. What's missing here? There's nothing in the Past. He's not telling them what has already happened. He's telling them about what is happening right then and what is to come. What church was on the scene right after Jesus died? What church came on the scene? Ephesus, the Christian church. These messages start with Ephesus. So he's telling Ephesus, listen, this is what's happening among you, and this is why God has a problem with you. But as he's writing, he writes to the other churches that ain't happened yet. So if they are watching and reading the prophecies, what should they look in Revelation and see? They should see themselves and know, and know what is coming. So if I go to the church at Pergamos and I start reading about it, then I should say, is that going to happen to us? Now I can make a choice to live a different life because I now know what's coming and I know what to be looking for. Does that make sense? So now what? Well, I don't even want to go there. I'm going to wait and we just, just build this on out. But John is in the place of the angel right now, speaking to Ephesus and the rest of the churches. And what does he say about Ephesus? What, 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 there's something good about Ephesus, and then there's some stuff that God says, this is problematic. Verse two says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them, what? Liars. Liars. Now, now, what does that mean right there? Because uh, sometimes we, 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 we run past something, and we, amen, and we keep on going, and we don't even know what we just read. So what, Ephesus has a problem with, with what kind of behavior? People who profess godliness, but are not living according to what they profess. And he says, I know thy works, and I can tell, I can see, you can't stand those who say they are apostles. Now, everybody's not called an apostle. But you have an issue with those who say they're apostles and are not. They are speaking something that is not true, and they're not living according to what they preach. You can't stand that. Then he says, 
You have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne, and has borne, and has patience, and from, for thy name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So you couldn't stand them, but you kept working with them. Nevertheless, the Bible says, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Now, what do we think is happening here? Because he said you, you have a problem with those who say they are apostles, and they are not. You have a problem with those who profess godliness, but they're not living it. You have a problem with those who are teaching something that they're not living. You have found these people to be liars, and then he said, I got a problem with you because you have left your first love. So if, if something happened, if a, if, if a couple got married and they were all just in love, but there were prob there's always going to be problems in the marriage. They're human. So if they start, their problems keep happening, but then you lose your first love, what happened? The problems got to be too much. And left untreated, you begin to fall out of love. So he's telling the people, listen, you have lost your, you have left your first love. You have been so busy trying to, to, to work with those who are liars and, and you have lost your footing. And you got to go back and find that love. You're going to have liars among you. You're going to have false teachers among you. Work with them, but stay connected to me. Now, each turn, I'm going to ask this question. Do we have that in Laodicea? So then what is the instruction for us? Labor with them. You can know they're liars. You can know they're false prophets. You can know all these things. Labor with them. But do not lose or leave your first love. So that don't mean I'm done with them. You keep laboring, but you don't lose your connection. And you don't get caught up and pulled into the nonsense and the lies that are out there. You will never, ever, ever, I did it early on, but you will never, ever, 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 ever catch me joining conversations on Facebook about what's going on. It's the road to nowhere. Nowhere. You think you've got the upper hand in the conversation. You're going on, you know, and then, and then paragraph to paragraph to paragraph to paragraph, and then somebody come in right and left, and you'd be like, what? I just made it clear. You keep working with them. You pick your battles, but you don't lose your connection to Christ. All right, now, let's move to the next church. Well, let, let, let's go on. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place. Verse 6 says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So what is the Lord saying to them? But I do look among you and I see something that I do appreciate. That you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, what are the deeds of the Nicolaitans? What, what, what was their belief? Once saved, always saved. How about they try to negate the divinity of Christ? Christ was just another man. You ever heard that? He's not our example. We can't get victory over sin. Well, the reason they say that is because you, they say you can't use Christ as an example. So they are denying the divinity of Christ. Now, he says, I look among you and I do see something I appreciate. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And let's go to the church of Smyrna. Verse 8. And unto the angel of the church on Smyrna, in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and alive. This is just a description of who? Christ, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. What does that mean? Thou art rich, and I know 
the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but what? Are the synagogue of Satan. Oh man, let's break this down. So, so he says, I know thy works and tribulation. What does that mean? I see thy works and I recognize you are going through some stuff. And poverty, but thou art rich, meaning they were poor people. I want you to, I want you to get this. They were, they were poor people, but they were rich in the sight of God. So they didn't have a lot of money, but they served God. All right? So, so money doesn't set us up for the kingdom. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. So in other words, Christ is saying, I, I know about the ones that are among you that say they are Jews. But are not. Now, do, do you think this means in the literal sense of being a Jew or in the belief and lifestyle of the Jew? All right. Because this message is not to the Jews. This is to the Gentiles. So he says, I, I recognize there are those among you who say they are Jews, but they are not. Let's see what he says about them. He calls it blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And I, he said, in other words, I look among you and I can tell, I can see there are those who are, who are professing godliness, but denying the power thereof. He calls it blasphemy. Do we want to blaspheme? So then we have to connect with Christ and live the life. How do we live the life of Christ? Through the power of Christ. He has to lead us and guide us. He has to mold us. This is how we live the life of Christ. Now, let's move on. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall come unto you. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Now, how, many, how long is that? Ten years. You shall have tribulation. So he's telling them, you're going to suffer tribulation for ten years. Should they look for, something, for a break in five? No. Because they've been told you shall suffer persecution ten years. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So he's telling them, you're going to go through tribulation ten years. This thing is going to be hard on you, but remain faithful. Now, how soon, Now you don't know the number of years, but how soon from the, from the birth of the Christian church did persecution become the tool that Satan preferred? The second church. They were already being persecuted. Why was that the case? Because Ephesus got a pure gospel. They had problems with those who were not being truthful. But they did not turn from the truth. People kept joining. Satan says, all right. When Smyrna comes along, just start killing them. Start putting them through tests and trials that are so hard to bear. Make people not want to join God's church. That didn't work. The promise was given, remain faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Goes on to say, in verse 12, we're looking at the church of Pergamos. Remember, John is giving these messages starting at the present and going forward. So when Smyrna came along, Smyrna should have been reading the scrolls 
and said, wait a minute. We're going to suffer persecution for 10 years. I better get to know Jesus for myself. I, I better make my calling and election sure in case I'm the one that has to die. But then it gets to Pergamos. This thing starts getting real good around Pergamos, y'all. And the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things say after which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Now, a question. Where was the church, where was the Pergamus church located? Right, it's right in the verse. What, what, is, what do you say in verse, in verse 12? Okay, so where is Satan's seat? Wrong. So the church, the Pergamus church is located in Rome. What did he say? He said that say your seat and thou holdest fast my name. Where, where, where is God's name found in his law? So what, what, what were they holding fast to? The law of God, the Sabbath. Then he says, I, I remember my, 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 my servant Antipas the martyr. Why was Antipas a martyr? Where were they? Why was he a martyr if he was a Christian? He was being persecuted by Rome. Now, the timetable or the time frame of the Church of Pergamos is 323 to 538. That, that, that 538 should, should get your attention. So the church at Pergamos was right before the Catholic Church. So now Pergamos was being persecuted, but they held fast to the name, the law. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and walk through some things right quick. What happened when Rome and Constantine did their stuff? And Constantine, he, you know, he tried to bring Christianity and paganism together. What happened to the Christian church? They became paganized. So Christianity became weaker because of a combination of paganism coming into the church. All right. Now, if that is the case, then we should see that in the next church. All right. Now. Wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now, this is to test your understanding of what you're reading. Is he saying that Balaam was a part of the church of Pergamos? Okay. No. So what is he using Balaam for? to get them to understand the mindset of some people who are holding a thought process that says, listen, we can mingle the two. This is how we become one. We, we lower the standards. If we lower the standards, then we can connect on points we have in common and we can become one that way. And the Lord says, I have a problem with you because there are some among you that hold this thought process. 
that we need to stop holding out our banner so strikingly. Why do we have to uphold the three angels everywhere? How come we can't let things down, let's quiet things down so we can connect together and become one? The question is, are we having that problem in Laodicea? Yes. Now God told Pergamos, I have a problem with that. So if it's happening among us, what is God telling us? I've got a problem with that. Now, the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast us. Now, now what is so interesting about, about Balaam? He was a former prophet of the Lord. How did he lose his way? Greed, covetousness. He liked the favor of people. And he already knew that he couldn't do nothing to Israel unless God said so, but because he just relished the thought of being liked by those. Well, I'll come over there because if I, I might could talk you down and get your money anyway. So then he goes and helps Balak. Nothing works. And he says, listen, this is really what you got to do. Invite them over. Get them to become friends with you. Offer this food to idols and then give it to them to eat. Get them to disobey. After that, you'll have no more problems. But Balaam was one of them. Balaam was one of them. They actually trusted Balaam. This is why I said at the beginning, we have to get out of trusting man. Get off leaning on the, on the flesh arm of man. We can't, it's not safe. You have to study for yourself. You have to know what is right for yourself. So then when somebody gets up and says, leave, because this is happening, that is happening, you just say, where am I going? It's not a question anymore. When somebody says, listen, this is happening, this is happening, you say, okay, why is that news? It's not news. Just prophecy taking place. And we should see for what it is. Sign, sign, sign. Ooh, sign. Wow, Lord, that, that's happening? What happened in Ezekiel? He was showing Ezekiel what was taking place. Ezekiel was like, wait a minute, I, wait a minute. I didn't know that was going on down there. <sighs> this thing is worse than I thought. The Lord said, before I do something, I show my servants the prophets first. So Ezekiel, you got to see it. So that you'll know that what I'm about to do is okay for me to do. And then he told him, he called in the six men. Because I haven't left yet. I'm just going to come to the threshold. Y'all come on in here. Let me have a word with you. You see what's going on. All right, y'all hold up. The man with the right of green corn, you come in and you start putting a mark on every person that is sighing and crying for the abomination that is done within. Now, when you study what sighing and crying for the abomination that is done within, what you don't find is someone standing on the wall pointing out all the wrongs. That's what you don't find. Let that sink in. Because many people think that sighing and crying is pointing out the dirty laundry. That is not sighing and crying. Sighing and crying is something different. It's actually much harder to do. What did Ephesus do? They knew they had problems, but they worked earnestly. Do we get that? They worked earnestly with the liars inside. Now they slipped, and the Lord said, now I have a problem. You can't lose your first love again. But they earnestly worked for those inside. 
Smyrna hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And after all their problems, the Lord says, but I do recognize that position you've taken, and that is a good position. You can't like it. So are we to like the problems we see? No. Should we keep working earnestly? Yes. Can you see in study in seven churches, we have instructions on what we ought to be doing right now. And not all this running around, confused, upset and angry, acting like we don't know. Why are we so bent out of shape? Because somebody wants to call us a cult. People ask me, what do you think? I don't care. Now, I want to stand for Christ in giving the truth. But I'm not worried because they call me a cult. Call me what you want. But you will call me a servant of God because that's the life I'm trying to live. They're going to call us much worse than that. Brothers and sisters, we should have our eyes peeled. And we should become unmovable in the midst of of a storm, an anchor so strong, so big, so heavy, that when it's dropped down to the bottom of the ocean, the winds blow, the water comes, but the ship just sits still. That's what we got to be. Well, now, let's see. Now, y'all told me to take my time. That was, that was dangerous. Now, Pergamus, Pergamus, this, this Balaam, and he's taught Balak how to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed. Verse 15 says, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine, that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So what else was a part of the church of Pergamos? The actual deeds. Remember, Ephesus said they just hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But here, those who commit the deeds of Nicolaitans are part of the church of Pergamos. We said what, what the doctrine was. To deny the divinity of Christ. To deny that you can have victory over sin. To deny that Christ sacrificed. When those they come and say, it was finished at the cross. No, sir. No, sir. A price was paid. But it ain't finished yet. Now, we've identified that what was in Pergamos is also in Laodicea. And we're painting a picture. If you're paying attention, this picture ain't good for Laodicea right now. We even have the deeds of the Nicolaitans at work in the church. We have the liars in the church. But now we're going somewhere good. When we get to the end, we're going somewhere real good. All of these things are a part of Laodicea as well. Then verse 16 says, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that, what's that word? Overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now we move to the church of Thyatira. And I'm going to give you this little bit of data at the beginning. The timetable for the church of Thyatira is 538 to what? Y'all are guessing. <laughs> Five, give, 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 give me, let's talk prophecy. If I give the date 538, what's the next date I'm looking for? 1798, come on now. 1260 years. So the church of Thyatira is in the period of 538 to 1798. We know, or we should know, what happened in this timetable. Come on, persecution. For how long? 1260 years. 
Times, times, and the dividing of times. So now, the church of Thyatira is in the timetable, 538 to 1798. Now, let's look at what God says to the third, uh, church of Thyatira about themselves. It says, let's drop down to verse 19. And I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience. Verse 19. Yeah, verse 19. I, I just skipped it because we, it's redundant. We keep reading. Yeah. Verse 19. I know thy works and charity. What's charity? Love. I know thy works and the love you have, and the service you give, and the faith you, you, you have. I see your patience and your works. How many times have works been, been, been used so far? Twice. And the last to be more than the first. So what do you see already? What's one of the key things about the Church of Thyatira or, or the Catholic Church works. Salvation by works. Now, let's, let's hear something now. Before they were corrupted, they had works. After they became corrupted, they looked at their salvation as based on their works. That's what paganism teaches. You work your way to heaven. But the Bible says, we won't know your faith without your works. So works are important, but Satan got in and was, was, was successful in getting them to turn their understanding and to begin to think that my works is what saves me. Instead of my works just show my belief in God. So I live a certain way. Let's see what it says. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And what happened? She repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, well, let's read this next one. Then we'll go back. And I will kill her. What? children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, let's go back. Make sure we're following. He says, I got a problem with you because you sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit Fornication. Now, what happened in Constantinople? Well, well, he moved his, to Constantinople. But in Rome, when the church connected with the state, you don't have to say it with confidence. When the church connected with the state, then this union brought paganism and Christianity together. Christianity began to die off. So Christianity began to die off. It needed some help to stay relevant. So it reaches out to who? The state for help. We got all these pagans in here, and they're not respecting what we do, and, and we need some help from the state to enforce our agenda. Wow. Now, when this began to happen, Christianity began to die off. Paganism began to rise. So Christianity didn't want to die off, so they began to just meld together. 
First of all, do we have that issue in the church? We have a combination of paganism and God's word trying to commingle in God's church. And God's message is suffering. But God says, I got this church called Laodicea that I'm going to talk real strong to, and I'm going to give them a solution. Because so far, he just tells them, I have a problem with you. If you repent, I won't remove your candlestick. But he's not going to say that to the church of Laodicea. He doesn't say that. He approaches them very differently. See when we get there. Now, this Jezebel called herself a prophetess, right? Now, Ahab was a Jew, right? He married Jezebel, who was a heathen or a pagan. Why did he marry Jezebel? She was not just a heathen. She was a princess of the god Baal. I heard it over here. I knew I was going to hear the right answer over here. <laughs> Ahab married Jezebel because of influence and power. So the church connected with the state for power, power and influence. What did she do when she got in? In the name of her husband, she had the prophets killed. She began to persecute God's servants. What is going to happen when the church and the state comes together? Who is going to suffer? God's people, the servants of God. And God, looking down through the ages, is talking to the church at Thyatira and says, listen, I have a problem because you allow this to happen. This is why in, in, in Ezekiel, when he's got Ezekiel in vision, he says, now listen, I want you to see what I'm going to do. I'm going to set a mark on those that sigh and cry. But when the, when the other men came in, he says, now after they have been marked, I want you to start not with the person that lives in the corner of Jerusalem over there. I want you to start with my church and start with those at the top of the church. Because they have led my people or allowed the spirit of Jezebel to come in among them and to cause my people to stumble. What does that look like in the household of faith right now? There are people being led astray. Because the spirit of Jezebel is allowed to stand true in God's church. So God says, I got a problem with that. And I'm going to deal with that. Because some of my people are stumbling. This is why we can't leave. Somebody stumbling, they just need somebody to grab them by the hand. And say, hold on, brother, you're going the wrong way. Hey, you're going to fall and hurt yourself. Stand up. Stand up, man. You bent over. Stand up. Let's look at what's going on. Let's study. And let's get on a sure foundation so you can stop falling all over the place. And you can walk straight forward. But, you know, you start at Ephesus and you work your, you work your way down. You see the picture is clear. God is asking us to do something today. Now, we know about Jezebel. What happened to Jezebel? How did she die? They tossed her out the window, and the dogs came and ate her. Ahab was killed, and the dogs came and licked up his blood. What did it say right here? What's going to happen? He said, I'm going to kill her. I'm not going to let her live. But I'm also I'm going to kill her children. Now, I brought the book, The Story of the Seer of Patmos, by Haskell. 
he says that Thyatira is Babylon. Not in the sense of calling the church Babylon, but the deeds that were going on in Thyatira represent the deeds of Babylon. What, what message do we have that gives a solution to that problem? Revelation what? 14, the third angel's message says what? Come out of her, my people. Babylon is fallen. It goes on to say that those who continue to stay connected to Babylon are what's going to happen to them. They're going to fall. So it, it says right here to the church of Thyatira, I'm going to take care of Babylon and everybody who follows Babylon. But in case you were thinking, well, that's, that, that's not for us then why do we have the third angel's message? Because we have got to turn this situation around. And the angel in Revelation 14 is representative of you and I. We have to give the third angel's message. God says, my law is my character, and I need somebody to stand up for my character and tell the world I did not change the Sabbath. I did not change none of my laws. I didn't change anything about myself. Now I'm looking for somebody to stand up and tell the world this. But if I can keep the people distracted and fighting with one another and not focus on the signs of the times and what we ought to be doing while the signs are happening everywhere, then the devil can keep on coming forward with the attacks. And we will never finish the work this way. The work was not finished with the apostles until they unified. Now, I know many of us are asking the question, but Brother Mason, how are we going to be unified? I don't see it. The disciples did not become unified until they got on one accord with Jesus. Until then, it's not possible. So what we have to do is begin to ask ourselves, Lord, do I know you? Because if I know you for myself and I'm trying to follow you where you are, I will, I'm going to be connected with my sister and my mama. That's, it's going to happen automatically because the spirit in them is going to connect to the spirit in me. But if I'm trying to come on you on one accord just so we can be cool with each other, that'll never happen. I'll just, I'll just share this with you. It is hard right now to get present truth ministers to come together. Mercy. Mercy. I want you to hear that. I'm not, not going to go no further with that. You cannot get them together. There's a spirit permeating God's ministry right now. Where someone, I'm up here. I'm doing this. Brother, sister, until we get to know Jesus, it's not going to happen. It is a shame, but it is what God said was going to happen. Yeah. Now, brother, sisters, Thyatira is in Laodicea. Now, let's, let's go forward. We got Sardis. And we got Philadelphia. The church of Sardis, the dates for that, 1798. Now, what possible dates could I be looking for past 17? 17? Okay, 1844. But now we got to bag up 33. We got to bag up 10 years. Anybody know why we got to back up 10 years? Mm -mm. Hmm? I heard over here, 10 days. I, I know he know the answer too. Why would we have to back up 10 days or 10 years? What does the sanctuary have tell us about the Day of Atonement? Before the Day of Atonement, 10 days before the Day of Atonement, the trumpet started to sound to 
Let them know that the Day of Atonement was coming. So 10 years before 1844, somebody began to blow a trumpet. What is his name? William Miller. William Miller. Right on time, he started blowing the trumpet in 1833, and he did so for 10 years, just like the sanctuary says. That's why Satan is trying to eradicate the sanctuary from God's people, because without that picture, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know where we ought to be. We don't know what kind of lifestyle we're supposed to be living. So he says, snatch that away from them. Because without prophecy as a light, we are standing in darkness. And the sanctuary is a prophecy. Now, now. 1798 to 1833. Verse 2 in chapter 3 says, well, let's read, let's read verse 1, because there's something special there. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Mm. What, what do you think he's talking about? Like, see, if you, if, you, if you observe it, based on the dates given, what would have happened between 1798 and 1833? You read about it in the, in the Great Controversy a lot. Wycliffe, Huss and Jerome, what's that called? The Reformation. So this church comes on the scene during the Reformation. So we know what happened during the Reformation. Wycliffe translated the Bible and Huss and Jerome and all these guys stood for, stood for the Lord. The light of the Bible began to come back because seven, uh, uh, 538 to 1798, the Bible was taken away. So it was called the what? The Dark Ages because the light of the word had been suppressed. So now this church comes on the scene. These guys, that God begins to use them. They begin to translate the Bible and the light of the Bible comes back to life, shining light on people. But then it says, but thou art dead. So what does that mean? What do you think that means? I'm picking your, your Adventist brain right now. What does that mean? What happened to Protestantism? It came alive, then it died. Now you see how a close study of the seven churches opens up a whole lot of information if we dig into it and see what's being said there. It says, be watchful, verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. They are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Here it is again. He that what? Overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before thy father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Now, in Sardis, the Reformation began. Light was coming. What did it mean to protest? What was being protested against? Or who was being protested against? Rome was being protested against by those who were trying to follow the Bible and the Bible only. Who was another notable name that we know? Martin Luther, by, of which, by the way, he was not trying to go against his church. He was trying to get them to see, hey, man, we, we got some problems here. We, our doctrines are kind of off. Hey, let me show you these 95 theses. He didn't know what was going to happen when he did that. But the, God used these men to raise up the Reformation, and Protestantism came to life. Now, Protestantism has taken a hit. But why? 
What happened to Protestantism? How did that happen? We, we stopped protesting, but, but, but how, what made us stop protesting? All we got to do is look back at some of the other problems in the other churches, because each church had, what happened in Ephesus happened in the next church, what they had, they also had from Ephesus as well. So what would have caused Protestantism to die? They wanted to mingle, why? Power. Fame. So we already see that in, 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 in past churches. So now Protestantism is protesting. America is born. We come, people come here to, for religious freedom. All these things happen. But eventually, Christianity wanted the power of the state. Yeah. Now, fast forward to today in our time. Is that happening? Is Christianity trying to get the government to pass their agenda? Now, let's, let's, let's see how diabolical Satan operates. How many would agree that abortion is good and right? Okay, I'm, I'm, I, I, it was rhetorical. I was hoping nobody would raise their hand. But Satan uses that argument and because the, 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 the evangelical church cannot get the, the nation to stop their moral slide, they go get the help of the state. Hey, we need your help to pass laws to stop this. So to both ends being worked against the middle. Because the moral problem is over here. The result of these actions People are getting pregnant, but then they don't want to go forward with it, and then the church goes, but now we need help. What's the real problem? Sin. The moral problem. We don't know God. That's the issue. But instead of trying to preach a message where the Holy Spirit can convict hearts, they say, we need your help to push our agenda. And then we're told, hey, don't get caught up into the politics. Satan is trying to use both ends to pull us in. He sets up a problem. He creates a problem. This solution is a problem. So then we're stuck in the middle. We can't choose that side, and we can't choose this side. We're stuck in the middle. We got to ride with Jesus and recognize that we are stuck in the middle of a battle that can only be won by a return to Jesus Christ. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to try to legislate a return to Jesus Christ. Now, this is what's happening in Sardis. The Church of Philadelphia, I'm just going to kind of skim past this. Well, not skim past it. But we kind of roll on through this so we can get to Laodicea. The Church of Philadelphia, 1833 to 1844. What was major about this? Uh, uh, I almost said Martin Luther. Uh, William Miller was preaching that Jesus was getting ready to come. There has not been a message preached more than the message he preached. We're told that his message did climb to the level of a loud cry. It started with him, but God was showing other men in other places the very same thing, and they started preaching the same thing, not knowing that somebody else was preaching it. And this message started being preached all around the world, and everybody was hearing it, and everybody was accepting it, and everybody was getting ready for Jesus to come. The world was getting ready for Jesus to appear. Then what happened in 1844? There was a great disappointment because they got it wrong. They thought Jesus was coming, but he was changing positions in the sanctuary. Now, let's just go on down to Laodicea because we need to make this point. Verse 15 says, 
Well, let's start at verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. What's the difference here? He didn't say, I know thy works and thy charity. I know thy works and this. He said, I know thy works, that you are neither cold nor hot. That's what I know about you. When I watch you operate, when I watch you behave, what I see is that you are neither cold nor hot. You are trying to find a way to walk in the middle and mingle paganism with, with my gospel. That's what I see. And you are neither on one side or the other. That's a problem for me. But the issue is, what has made Laodicea lukewarm? I just gave the answer. Because they want to mingle. Now, how is it that the church at Laodicea wants to mingle so badly? So for power, I want you to think about something, though. I want you to think about something. How do your children act like you? They come from you. So they have your DNA. All the issues from the other churches keep compounding. We come on the scene, and it's in our DNA. We want to mingle. We want that power. We, 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 we don't want to be cold or hot. We want to be in the middle, because this, this warm shower feels good. So our DNA says, we don't want to choose sides. We want to be in the gray area. And God says, that's a problem because there's no such thing as a gray area. I look for you on the right or on the left. I don't look in the middle. I watch your behavior. And what I notice is that you are neither cold nor hot. He said, I got a problem. So then he says, because thou art neither cold nor hot, what am I going to do? I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now, remember, he's been using the term, I'm going to use my mouth as a two-edged sword. So I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, but the way I'm going to do that is going to cut you two ways. So as I am trying to get you to choose one or the other, I'm going to send a message to shake you up before I got to spit you out completely. Laodicea is full of the problems of the other six churches, all combined in one. And Christ has said, but there's something special about this church at Laodicea. I have some inside that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And out of this church that is full of all of the problems of all the other churches, I got some that are going to do something special for me. Then it says, I, verse, verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, he says, I'm going to spew out because of what you say and do. You say you are rich and have need of nothing. So what are we doing when, we, when, when that's the case? What is that behavior saying? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need, Lord, I don't need what you have specified. That's my solution to my problem. You say I need prophecy. I don't like prophecy. You say I need eye salve. I don't, I don't want nobody messing with my eyes. Leave me alone. You say I need this. I feel like I'm rich and I have need of nothing. Well, I don't need you. Well. He says, now, now, none of the other churches talked to me like that. None of them did. 
Now you're the insubordinate child. You're talking to me. You're saying, uh, Dad, I don't need you. I don't know how I'm going to make it, but I don't want you. Then he says, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not. He says, it, it irritates me that you would talk this way, and I'm looking at you, and you are miserable. You are wretched. You're poor. You're blind and naked. You don't have sense of nothing going on around you. You're not hearing right. You're not seeing right. You're not acting right. You're not healthy. You are destitute, and you can't see none of it. But when I come to you with loving arms, when I send servants to you, when I raise up messages out of the Bible, when I raise up messages out of the spirit of prophecy, instead of you listening to them, you fight against them. And I'm getting ready to come, and I don't want to remove your candlestick. And he never says, he never threatens to move the candle. He just says, I'm going to spew you out. But then he says, but I didn't say this to the other churches. I'm fixing to give you a solution to your problems. Let's see what he says. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be what? Rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So he says, listen, I, I didn't tell none of the other churches, I just told them to repent. But you are the last church. You are the church that's going to be on the scene when I actually come back. So let me give you the solution to your wretched problem. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. I think we know what that is. What is that gold tried in the fire? It's faith. Gold tried. So, so you don't think that I'm making it up. Let's go to 1 Peter. First Peter, chapter 1. Let's, let's, let's read all three verses. Let's read 5 through 7. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. We got to know this, y'all. This is a solution to our problem. When you have it, let me hear you say amen. amen. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold, what is that? Temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So this gold tried in the fire is faith. Now, we have to endure the trial of our faith. So even our faith has to be what? Tested. Now, y'all... When I tell you that our mindset around temptations and trials has to become different. It's God's single tool for preparing us to see him in peace. Now, he says, I, I, buy, I counsel thee by me gold tried in the fire. That's faith, that thou mayest have all these things. Be uh, uh, rich and white raiment so that a nakedness not show. What is nakedness a representative of? Sin. So then how, if our sin is going to be covered up, what is going to have to happen? It's right there in the same verse. We're going to have to be clothed with white raiment. So that means he's going to cover our sins. How, does, how do our sins get covered? 
by the blood that was shed on the cross. But how do we get there? What do we have to do? We have to confess. We have to repent of our sins. And now the definition of repentance means to do what? Turn away from the sin. So he says, bring that sin to me. Leave it with me, but turn away from it and don't go back. So then you begin to walk on the high places and have victory over sin, not because I'm strong, not because I got some special endowment. No, because I've connected myself with Jesus Christ and I'm surrendering to him day after day. And he's the one living in me. So with Christ's help, I stand tall and I stop listening to the devil. I become like Job. Now, when you study that thing about Job, that thing needs to grab you. The Bible says that Job was a perfect and an upright man. But God still allowed him to be tested. He was already perfect and upright. The prophet tells us that even after we are sealed, we will have personal tribulation. Even after being sealed, we still going to be tempted. Satan is not going to give up. Even though we're sealed and our destination is set, he says, I'm still trying to trip them up. Job was a perfect and upright man, but what was the key to his success? The Bible says he as cheweth evil. He stopped listening or paying attention to the devil. That's the only way we overcome. Just stop listening. If you get into a conversation like Eve did, you take the fruit. And you fall. I'm like, Lord, plug my ears so I don't even hear him. Help me not to turn and listen. Definitely don't conversate. I talk to Jesus. You can talk to Jesus. Now. Yeah. Let's see what, ah, y'all see that definition? The attempted reconciliation or union of different or opposing principles, practices, or parties as in philosophy or religion. That's what happens when you try to mingle paganism and Christianity. The word is syncretism because they, they are opposed to each other but you're trying to bring them together, and it doesn't work. Let's, let's get down here. In the absence of the persecution, there have drifted into our ranks men who appear sound and their Christianity unquestionable. But who, but who, if persecution should arise, would go out from us? The Savior's words have a message of comfort to those also who are suffering affliction or bereavement. Our sorrows do not spring out of the ground. God doth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. I want you to get this. When he permits trials and afflictions, you read the next, the next four words. Now, now, I find the word prophet challenging. He says, he per when he permits it, it is for our profit. That means that any, and I mean any trial and temptation that comes, has been weighed, and he says, this will help them become like me. So when we complain about the trials, what are we saying to the Lord? I don't like the way you're handling me. I don't like what I'm going through. I don't like to stop this fire. He said, don't you want to see me? And then we said, yes, Lord, I want to see you. He said, but then you're not ready to see me yet. But I'm ready to leave the most holy place. I'm tired of standing here watching what sin is doing to you. So I'm sending trials, and yes, I'm amping it up because I'm trying to get you to let go. I'm, I'm, listen, you're going through grief. 
I waited before it happened. I already knew what the outcome was supposed to be after it happened. I already did, didn't catch me by surprise. I'm allowing things to happen to your health for a reason. Wow. Wow. I'm allowing it to get your attention so you'll stop complaining and start talking to me about you. But if you don't pass the test, I'm going to have to let your body keep going through it. I let you lose your job. Yes, I knew you were the best at your job, but I let you lose it on purpose. Because I'm trying to burnish you. And it's only when we're down on the ground where we will finally look up and say, Lord, I relinquish. I'm sorry. Do what you must. But if he takes every trial and says, OK, no, they don't have to go through that. No, they don't. Have to. We forget about God. And we will be standing around and saying, I'm ready to go to heaven. And we're not doing nothing. So he says, I got to amp up the trials. What you went through, I saw it coming. And then I, I, I grabbed the problem and put it on the scale. It seemed a little heavy. So then I put my hand on the other side and picked it up. If they connect to me, they can pass this test. So I let it come to me. Now, when I read this, it shook me because I'm like, Lord, there's some things I done went through. You said that for my prophet. I don't, I, don't even, I don't even see it. I don't even understand it. It don't add up. But I'll tell you this, I'm not certain that I would know the Lord like I do if my dad was still alive. That's hard. But I didn't start studying for myself till he was gone. What you see happening now is because I started listening and following Christ for myself. God says, listen, I will let the hardest thing happen to you if it will save you. It will not make sense. It will not add up. It will, it, it will blow your mind. But I've got a plan when I let things happen in your life. If you just look to me, Say, Lord, help me. I'm destitute of you. I don't really know you. I thought I did. But I don't really know you. But I want to see you in peace. He says, now, son, daughter, if you want to see me, what I'm about to do is about to hurt. But when you make it through and you are saved, we all going to be on a sea of glass together. Yes, and we're going to say, Lord, I, I can't believe I made it over. Your angels are going to look at you and say, I was nervous for you. It didn't look good for a while, but you finally started listening. And here you are. I'm so glad to see you. If we would take the time of preparation we have right now and really get to know Jesus, and consult with Jesus and say, Lord, try me if you must, but set me up to be successful. Yes. Yes. It says, if received in faith, the trial that seems so bitter and hard to bear will prove a blessing. The cruel blow that blights the joys of earth will be the means of turning our eyes to heaven. How many there are who would never have known Jesus had not sorrow led them to seek comfort in him. That means they would have never found him. They would have never connected if it wasn't for sorrow. Now get this. If we overcome our trials, 
Point number one. And get the victory over the temptations of Satan. Number two. Then we endure. What is that? Now, didn't we just read about that in First Peter? If we, and this is the faith that we find in Revelation. If we overcome our trials, that means if we make it through our trials with God's help and get the victory over the, tempta of the temptations of Satan, that's victory over sin, then we endure the trial of our faith. That's the solution to our wretchedness. So when he says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, he said, I'm, I, I counsel you to buy of me faith. Your faith journey, your faith walk will consist of two things. Overcoming your trials and getting the victory of the temptations of Satan. That is your faith journey. With those two things, if this happens, you have endured the trial of your faith, which is more precious than gold and are stronger and better prepared to meet the next. But if we sink down and give way to the temptations of Satan, we shall grow weaker and get no reward for the trial and shall not be so well prepared for the next. And this is the last one. God has shown me that he gave his people a bitter cup to drink, to purify and cleanse them. It is, it is a bitter draught, and they can, still, they can make it still more bitter by murmuring, complaining, and repining. But those who receive it thus, meaning you receive it with complaining and murmuring and repining, if you receive it thus, must have another drop. For the first does not have its designed effect upon the heart. And if the second does not affect the work, then they must have another and another until it does have its designed effect. Or they will be left, what is that? Filthy, impure, in heart. I saw that this bitter cup can be sweetened by what? Patience, endurance, and prayer, and that it will have its designed effect upon the hearts of those who thus receive it, and God will be honored and glorified. It is no small thing to be a Christian and to be owned and approved by God. Brothers and sisters, we need the trials. God says, I need to remake you into my image. Because I love you, I will let you have some good times, but the trials must come. And if you are suffering, meaning if you, since you are complaining and repining, I'm going to stop the test, but I'm going to have to give you another drink. And just because you, you pass this test, that has nothing to do with the next test. It just says you're more prepared. But I'm going to give you another test. And another test. And another test. Until you look just like me. Now, brothers and sisters, we are living in the end of this world's history. This is it. We prove that this generation is our generation. We are going to see all these things fulfilled right in front of us. We have, we're in the sixth seal. We're in the sixth trumpet. We're in the sixes of everything. Jesus is saying, I've been in the most holy place for a long time. I'm really ready to reach for the curtain and move it out the way and come out. But every time I get ready to do that, I look at my people and I say, they're not ready. Hold the four winds of strife until they are ready to be sealed. I love them. I don't want them to be lost. But they are playing games. 
This message to Laodicea is causing a shaking. What side are you on? Do you know Jesus for yourself? That is the present truth for today. Do you know him? Because no matter where I am, if I know him, I will be saved by him. We need to get to know Jesus. If we overcome the temptations of Satan and overcome the trials of our, faith, of our, of our life, then we have endured the trial of our faith. This process, we are told, will cause us to be prepared to be sealed and see Jesus in peace. I'll tell you right now, I don't have the words to cause us to be urgent. But here's what I know. We need the Holy Spirit. If we connect to God, if we connect to the Holy Spirit, the urgency will come. But if we try to connect to Jesus in our own way, we try to, we try to overcome, we try to move to the country, we try to do these things that we know we need to do, but we're not connected to Christ, we're just getting an exercise in end time preparation. But we need to get to know Jesus and a personal savior. I'm gonna ask you right now, before we leave, if you know for a fact that right now, I don't know Jesus. That might be a frightful thing right now, but if you can look inside your heart and mind and say, Lord, I wish I could say I know you, but I know that I really don't, I don't know you. I'm still complaining about the trials of my life. I'm still repining. I'm still complaining. When I look at the mirror, I don't see you. I see me still. Today, God has given you an opportunity to make a different choice. If you say right now, I I need more studies. I need, I, need, I need some help getting on my feet because I've been stumbling because of things that's in front of my feet. I'm going to ask you to stand and say, I want more studies. I, I want to get together with God's people. I need to know more. I realize I, I, I like hanging around God's people, but I don't really know him, and I don't, I'm not sure what's in front of me. If you know you need to take a step further, and getting baptized, we, we don't have any facilities here, but it, we can help you get set up where you can be baptized if you need to be baptized. It's high time for us to wake out of sleep, brothers and sisters. Jesus is getting ready to come. The, this world is going down, 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 and man doesn't have an answer. Only Christ. And he gave it to Laodicea. Buy of me. Connect with me, and I'll lead you through the journey. We need to study our word and spend much time on our knees, begging God. Just like it says in early writings, they were pleading with God, expressive of an internal struggle. They knew they needed to pray. They knew they needed Jesus. As we get ready to pray, I want you to pray silently to the Lord and you give him that clear communication about what you see about yourself. Because I can't handle to know about you, but God knows about you. Ask the Lord to lead you and guide you, to grab you and to help you, help me, lay self aside. For if we do this, God will do something amazing. Jesus is getting ready to come. And if we don't know him, let's get to know him. If we know him, let's come up higher. Amen? Let us pray. Let us kneel. Yes.
Father in heaven, Lord, you have come into this place. You've spoken to our hearts. You have shown us things through your word. Lord, now we are coming to you, Lord. We see we are indeed Laodicea thoroughly. But Lord, we don't want to remain in the middle. We want to be hot. And Lord, we are pleading with you right now to help us, Lord. For some of us here, this may be the first time we ever heard such a message. Lord, be with that person. Put your angels around them, Lord. Surround them. Guide them. Protect them. Lord, for some of us, we've heard these messages over and over and over. And Lord, today we're saying, Lord, I've fallen back asleep somehow. I don't know how it happened. But Lord, thank you for waking me up. Now, grab my hand and lead me, Lord, like you did, Lot. Lead me out of sin. Lord, our hearts are burning right now. We want to see you in peace. We can only imagine what heaven is like. We don't want to miss it, but more than just not being there, Lord, I want to see you face to face. Lord, I pray for the young people that are here. Lord, protect them. For they don't understand that there is an enemy that hates them. Lord, help us as parents and adults to set the right environment around them, to be a model. Lord, as we have gathered here in the Learning Center, Lord, we're asking and pleading for the Holy Spirit. Help us as men to lead our households, Lord. Help us to be faithful. Lord, I pray for the ladies that they will follow their husbands as their husbands follow you and that the children will follow her as she follows her husband, as he follows you. Lord, we are wretched, but we don't want to remain this way. We are miserable and blind, but we don't want to remain this way. Lord, execute the solution. We recognize that we are giving you permission to turn up the heat. But Lord, with your help, you've already waited. You already know we can make it. Lord, as we depart from this room for lunch, Lord, we ask that the convictions that are upon our hearts right now will not abate, will not leave. Lord, may the conversations we have continue this conversation of getting to know you. Thank you for coming here and visiting with us. We know it's because you love us. But we pray for the food that has been prepared that it may nourish our bodies. Lord, lead us on to further blessings today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.